we wanted to find out just how much mercury is emitted from broken compact fluorescent light bulbs. To measure this, we selected the Jerome 431X Mercury Vapor Analyzer. We chose this instrument because it's the same one used by the EPA. It has been used in the remediation and toxic cleanup industry for years, and it's known to be accurate and reliable. First, we tested a normal fluorescent light bulb that we purchased at Home Depot, a Philips F30. We sealed the bulb in a thin cellophane bag and placed the bag containing the bulb in a conventional plastic trash container. We poked a small hole in the bag just large enough to fit the wand of the mercury analyzer through. After turning the mercury analyzer on, we inserted the end of the wand into the bag so we could read the mercury levels inside the bag. We then took a reading to measure the ambient air inside the bag without the ball being broken. Not surprisingly, our first reading showed no mercury vapor. We took a total of 10 readings inside the bag with the unbroken fluorescent bulb to be sure we were getting reliable measurements. All 10 readings showed zero micrograms per cubic meter of mercury vapor. We then broke the bulb Watch while it was eyes. still inside the cellophane bag. Unfortunately, breaking the bulb tore a rather large hole in the bag. We then took our first reading inside the bag with a broken fluorescent bulb. Our first measurement detected 127 micrograms per cubic meter of mercury vapor. We then took three subsequent readings. The final one showed 395. With a total of four readings, we had a low value of 127 and a high of 451. Now remember, this was for a normal fluorescent light bulb. Next, we decided to test a low mercury F30 fluorescent bulb. The green end caps on the bulb denote that this is a low mercury or green bulb. So again, we put the bulb in a bag and poked our hole, just as we had done previously. We then took 10 measurements inside the bag with the bulb unbroken. Not surprisingly, our first reading was zero. We then took nine more measurements, and as expected, each measurement was zero. Next, we broke the low mercury bulb, which was quite a bit harder to do than with the previous normal fluorescent bulb. We then took our first measurement for the low mercury fluorescent. Okay, get the zeros. It was 640. We took a total of four readings. Of these four readings, our lowest was 197, and our highest actually was above the meter's ability to read. In this case, the readout just displays HL. Next, we tested a typical compact fluorescent bulb that we again purchased at Home Depot. Okay. We wrapped the unbroken bulb in plastic and then poked a hole in the bag, just as we did with the previous bulbs. Then, we took our first reading. This time, we got a reading of 7 micrograms of mercury vapor. We then took a total of 10 readings inside the bag with the unbroken CFL bulb. All readings except the first showed zero micrograms of mercury vapor. Our best guess for the reason we read seven on our first sample is that there was probably still some mercury vapor lingering around from our previous measurements, which were done immediately before this one. Moving along, we broke the compact fluorescent bulb inside the bag just as we had done with the previous bulbs. Yeah, pretty well. Should I break it some more? No, that's good. Okay. We then took our first reading. That's good. You have to be too close. Okay. 
Oh my gosh. The mercury level was so high, the meter was unable to read it. We then took our second reading. Hmm. Again, the mercury vapor levels were too high to read. At this point, we didn't bother taking any more measurements because when the analyzer gets readings this high, it requires a self-cleaning session and recalibration, which are somewhat time-consuming. So, we decided to move on to the last part of our experiment. Incandescent bulbs. We tested a typical 75-watt incandescent bulb by Sylvania. So, we poked our hole and took our readings. Our first reading without breaking the bulb showed 4 micrograms of mercury vapor. Our second reading showed 0. Our third, 0 again. Once again, we believe the initial level of 4 occurred because of ambient mercury vapor from the previous bulb. Of course, all of the remaining readings were 0. Once again, we broke the bulb inside the bag. We then took our mercury vapor readings inside the bag. Zero. Look at that. Our first reading with a broken incandescent bulb returned no mercury vapor. We then took a total of 10 measurements. At the end of our measurements, the data for the incandescent bulb looked like this. There was no mercury vapor detected when the incandescent bulb was broken. So, let's take a look at our average results for broken bulbs. The normal fluorescent gave us an average reading of 334 micrograms per cubic meter of mercury vapor. The low mercury green fluorescent gave us a slightly higher level of 348. The compact fluorescent gave us readings so high that our meter could not read them. So all we know in this case is that the mercury vapor levels were above 999 micrograms per cubic meter. And finally, the incandescent bulb gave us no mercury vapor at all. Now let's take a look at mercury vapor exposure limits set by major organizations. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, sets a legally enforceable ceiling limit for workplace exposure at 100 micrograms per cubic meter. Mercury concentration cannot exceed this level at any time during the workday. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, sets its recommended exposure limit at 50 micrograms per cubic meter as a time-weighted average for an 8-hour day. The American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists recommends a threshold limit value of 25 micrograms per cubic meter as an average exposure for a normal 8-hour workday. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has set a minimum risk level for inhalation exposure at 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter. The minimum risk level is an estimate of the daily human exposure to a hazardous substance that is likely to be without appreciable risk of adverse health effects over a specified period of time. ATSDR also recommends an action level of 1 microgram per cubic meter. This level of contamination triggers remediation if exceeded in indoor air. The Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, sets a reference concentration of 0.3 micrograms per cubic meter for inhalation of mercury. This value is a screening tool used to help risk assessors determine where to focus their investigations into hazardous exposures. The EPA claims that adverse health effects do not necessarily result from exposure at this level. 
This same level of 0.3 micrograms per cubic meter has been adopted by the state of Maine and is referred to as the Maine Ambient Air Guideline. We call the state of Maine Department of Environmental Protection and ask what this reference level is used for. They told us when this level is detected at a site, then further investigation into the source of mercury contamination is warranted and conducted. In May 2007, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection conducted a comprehensive study related to the mercury contamination from broken CFL bulbs. In this study, 45 light bulbs were broken in a small room while mercury vapor levels were recorded at varying heights. Here's a short excerpt from the study's executive summary. Mercury concentration in the study room air often exceeds the main ambient air guideline, MAAG, of 300 nanograms per cubic meter. For some period of time, with short excursions over 25,000 nanograms per cubic meter, sometimes over 50,000 nanograms per cubic meter, and possibly over 100,000 nanograms per cubic meter, from the breakage of a single compact fluorescent lamp. A short period of venting can, in most cases, significantly reduce the mercury air concentrations after breakage. Concentrations can sometimes rebound when rooms are no longer vented, particularly with certain types of lamps and during or after vacuuming. Mercury readings at the one foot height tend to be greater than the five foot height in non-vacuum situations. Although following the pre-study cleanup guidance produces visibly clean flooring surfaces for both wood and carpets, all types of flooring surfaces tested can retain mercury sources even when visibly clean. Flooring surfaces, once visibly clean, can emit mercury immediately at the source that can be greater than 50,000 nanograms per cubic meter. In the executive summary provided by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, mercury vapor levels are recorded in nanograms per cubic meter. In our experiment, we measured mercury vapor in micrograms per cubic meter. So, in order to easily compare the results of the two experiments, we must convert nanograms to micrograms. In the Maine Department of Environmental Protection study, Mercury levels in a small room with a broken CFL bulb reach levels of 25,000, 50,000, and 100,000 nanograms per cubic meter. When you convert these values to micrograms, we can see that these values begin to correlate with the levels we witnessed when testing the bulbs in small, unsealed plastic bags. We would, of course, expect our levels to be higher than those witnessed by the main study because we were taking readings from a much smaller volume of air. You can read more about the main CFL study by visiting this address. It has been estimated that a light bulb is broken in a house every four years. Based on the main CFL study, that house can be contaminated with mercury at levels so high it will exceed the NIOSH maximum for a factory, in some cases even double it, even after the EPA recommended cleanup procedure is completed. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry's minimum risk level for mercury vapor is 200 nanograms per cubic meter. The main CFL study stated that air in the test room often exceeded this level by 30 percent even after surfaces were visibly clean. The ATSDR publishes an action level for mercury vapor of 1,000 nanograms per cubic meter. This is the level that triggers mercury remediation. In the main study, the mercury emitted at the source of the CFL ball breakage was more than 50 times above this action level, even when the site of the CFL breakage was visibly clean. Within the next five years, over 80 percent of houses will have had a light bulb broken inside of them. So the next time you're shopping for a home or looking for an apartment, you may just want to bring a mercury vapor meter 
to make sure you're not moving into a disease-causing factory. Since the world's leading mercury researchers have revealed that mercury may cause over 200 of the most common diseases and medical conditions, who do you think really benefits from the sale of CFL bulbs?